Hey, I'm Jimmy Fike, and you're watching the Break It Down Show. Jimmy, I love what you're doing. I love your book. Uh, I want to talk about it here in a moment, but um, just thanks for doing this. You know, these these kind of operations that seem, I don't know, seem so small, especially like I, I coincidentally took a picture of an onion flower today from our garden, right? But um, turns out stuff like this matters, and it matters for generations and generations. So uh, I guess, why don't you introduce your book to everybody so we can get into that, and then we'll go from there. Okay, sure. Yeah, so I was really lucky to have my book published in March by Red Lightning Books. And this book here, actually, right here, it's called Edible Plants. And this uh, features my photography. I've been working on a project for 13, 14 years now, traveling around the U.S. of A, finding and photographing wild edible plants. And uh, yeah, it came together with this book that is kind of like a field guide, but a coffee table version of a field guide. So it can really show off the photography. But yeah, it is formatted like that. So you've got an illustration of the plant and then uh, a description next to it about where you might find it, uh, its, its characteristics, uh, its, its edibility, things like that. How did you, uh, is this on theme for you or what's the, where did this idea come from? You know, it was a very new type of work for me uh, before this series, which I mentioned, I've been doing this a long time now, but before that, uh, wow, I spent years doing kind of a lot of drawings that were more stream of consciousness and uh, pretty dark and humorous and a lot of work before that that was kind of about cyborg theory and technology and work that was kind of about photography. Hmm. Uh, but I made this real, real shift in my work. And uh, I think part of it was... Uh, I was doing a seminar with the grad students and we were talking about just kind of like problems in late postmodernism, you know, and how that was reflected in the art world and a lot of work that they were making where you see, you saw a lot of artists kind of I don't know, wallowing in fatalism and uh, uh, disconnection and these kind of ailments of late postmodernism. Right. Uh, and uh, as much as I encouraged them to kind of take on, take a new approach to these problems, it kind of, really kind of uh, gave me a poke too. And I was like, well, I need to heed my own advice and rethink my, my practice. And I've always been into nature and consider myself an environmentalist and uh, decided to see if I could do some work that really took those issues on and offered kind of, I guess, a palliative approach, uh, healing spirit. Right. Um, and, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence either that my daughter was born right about that time. And I think, you know, anybody's a parent, you know, you start to really feel like, gosh, Maybe I should do some work to try and leave the world a better place for, for that generation and for my kid. Yeah, daughters, daughters and sons, they do that to you. They make you look around and go, what have I been doing? I got to <laughs> beautiful stuff here. Yeah, um, totally. I want to show you my picture real quick before we get too far. All okay, right, let me see. Morning. Oh, let yeah. Me, let me get rid of the, uh, the thing here. Sorry not to sell your book here for a moment. But um, it's just in my backyard, right? And I, I think yeah. it's cool that... We can take a modern look, and that's not professional or anything. I just like, hey, this is really pretty today, and zoomed in. And the more I zoomed in, the prettier it got. And I saw, so I snapped this pic. I, I guess the point is not to celebrate Pete's work as a photographer, but just to, <laughs> I guess just to kind of illustrate that this food uh, is all around us, right? I'm reading a book right now about um, uh, an early 1900s exploration of the the polar sea, that kind of thing. Whoa, cool. And yeah, it's really crazy. And of course, it all goes wrong, right? Because it's polar exploration, so it's hard. Yeah. And one of the things they realize is there's like this grass that they uh, recognize, like the Scottish guys like, oh, we have this. We can eat this. This is this is not the best food, but it's food. Right. And so mm -hmm. they take and they're able to make the, you know, the seal blubber that they're chewing on just a little bit more palatable because they have this edible grass that yeah. only revealed itself in the spring. But there's literally food all around us. And it's neat that you thought this this is how I want to contribute to things. Yeah, it really does uh, just surround us. So it's been very uh, revelatory to me. You know, a lot of these plants, maybe they're just kind of small, you know, so unless you really slow down and, and look carefully, you just kind of pass by them as this like green blur that's out there. You yeah. Know? But uh, man, if, if you'll just kind of slow down and if you have a lawn, just let it grow a little bit and start looking around, uh, you, you'll probably find 10 edible things just growing in your lawn easy. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, it is crazy, right? And it's free, 
free food and it's growing, you know, without pesticides, fertilizers, extra water, you know, it's just there. And we have a really, really long, beautiful evolutionary relationship uh, to it and with it. So it's good stuff. When you, when you think about the ever presence of food and, and we don't have to forage like yeah i love when people say like these are foraged mushrooms like really are, are they really foraged or is that just <laughs> brand new from, you know but yeah. uh but it, not that long ago we did have to go out and find food and make it show up and there's certainly lifestyles where that actually happens all the time mm -hmm. but the um the abundance of food does require you to slow down because it, it takes time and effort to bend down and gather and pull roots out and all these other things yeah yeah, you know, you gotta you gotta think that for uh, thousands of years of human evolution, this was one of the primary tasks to figure out what these green things were that are growing around us and how you could use them for food or medicine or tools or you know weapons or you know all, all those kind of things. And really, within just a couple generations, so much of that was lost. Yeah, with modern agriculture and move to more urban areas and you know things like that. Yeah. yeah. Sure. We're basically the same age you and I were both born in 70. And oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm curious how how you see the world. Like I grew up in California, you grew up somewhere else. But the um the things that we've discovered and and evolved with though over the last 50 plus years is pretty remarkable. I think we're often too hard on ourselves in general as an American society, with you know, in and it's not like Laura Ingalls Wilder who grows up on the prairie, right? And then lives to the point where there's not just flight but rockets, right? I mean, that's that's yeah. insane. But yeah. I think we're experiencing the same kind of thing, and it's it's hard to see in the real time to slow down and really look around socially. So, like as, as a kid born in the 70s, 70, um, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, are we are we doing pretty good overall as a humanity, or are we doing terrible? I don't know. What do you think? Ooh, that's a that's a big question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, we definitely have seen crazy changes, right? Uh, yeah. We grew up really right before computers, home computers, and internet. You know, we've seen all that, all that transition. So yeah, the world has been radically changed before our eyes, and you know, we just kind of keep keep adapting to these changes, but they seem to speed up. Yeah. Right? And so that that gives, I think, us less time to reflect and adapt. You know, we're in a constant mode now of just. Uh, uh, rapid change and yeah. assimilation. And I, I don't know, I feel like kind of neutral about these ideas about uh, progress versus regression, you know, in some ways, right. There's still like this human psychology has been kind of a constant uh, throughout. Mm. And so as much as we see progress in certain areas or something you could call progress, you also see kind of these same old, same old problems. I mean, like, look, Look at Ukraine, you know, didn't you think we were past the uh, stage where we would see some sort of war like that? And on the European continent, it just, uh, you know, it's, it's really boggles your uh, mind to think that that could be a possibility at this day and age. Right. So that doesn't seem like progress to me. Right? And when you see yeah. uh, kind of, you know, as, as an environmentalist, uh, you know, you, you, you kind of get overwhelmed by the yeah. severity of the problems with climate change and species extinction and loss, loss of habitat, you know, yeah. you, you do see ho hopeful uh, signs and you see solutions on the horizon. But if you're taking a, a account of where we are right now, it's kind of grim. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know, but also I think kind of my interest in, in Buddhism has uh, given me a, a perspective to think about those things as kind of, just the ness the isness of them without too much labeling of progress versus regression, you know. Sure. Sort of stuff. sure. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of the things that we're trying to solve are, are problems as old as there's as we've existed, right? People not getting along, people being intolerant, whatever it's gonna be. Yeah. Oh, being greedy. Sound. Huh? Greedy. You know? Oh yeah. I think yeah, that's yeah. many of the problems we face right now is kind of due to a type of right. type of greed and yeah. Yeah. Everybody's just looking out for themselves type of mentality, you know. And there's literally never enough. I mean, if you go to so – I worked a lot in Iraq and Afghanistan, right? I mean, you see people oh. that don't have enough, and you yeah. see the behaviors of revolving around that. 
you know, we look at that as a place that has enough as corruption, but the reality is, is we're the corrupter, you know, like, <laughs> shit in. and yeah. so, so people hoard because they don't have enough and, and you never have enough, right? Having more is, is a thing. Like, do you need a hundred thousand dollar car? Eh, you know, no, but we sure as heck don't get mad at people that we look up to people that have hundred thousand dollar cars. Right. And so we, we have this uh, ever, ever evolving problem, like you were talking about where, you can gain in some areas, but other areas, you know, we, we get a lot worse. I mean, I thought we were past, at least in our lifetime, I thought we were going to get past like the color of skin and, and yeah. uh, how we treat people. But it seems that we are upon a new age of a new version of that. And it's that stuff, no matter how you justify it, it's no good. It's no good. Yeah. But, it's just persistent, but, right? That's right. kind of what I was meant about. Like there's just a human psychology, mm, you know, yeah. and these problems just seems pretty baked in. Yeah. <laughs> Unless yeah. we kind of go, can go through some real evolution of, of consciousness and ethics and things like that. Right. No, no yeah. And, and focusing, look, I think if we focus on improving the self, you know, not to be completely stoic about this, but if we slow down and realize, you know, our impact on our own lives and try to improve that, there's a lot of work there. Are you familiar at all with Edward O. Wilson's writing and his work? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. I love you, O. Wilson. Yeah. So, Rest in peace. Right. Rest in peace. And gosh, I wish yeah. I would have had that guy. I didn't discover him until recently. But mm -hmm. the um, the thing about him, right, because this is for the audience, because you probably know this already. He he studied ants and at like the top of the ant world level, like he, he mm -hmm. did so much work. But for him, the ant world, it was everywhere. So like if you wanted to go on vacation with him, count on it. You weren't going to see him very much. He'd be on his hands and knees examining ants in micro detail and finding mm -hmm. constantly finding new species or understanding how the species interrelated and in, in the biosphere. And Oh my God, it was all the time with that guy. But here's this guy who's not just micro, he's nano focused on these extremely small worlds yeah. and then relating them to our world. It's remarkable. It is remarkable. You know, that, that, um, that work about the leaf cutter ants is really seminal and really blew my mind. You know, just because of the complexity of their uh, societies and their ability to communicate and take on different roles. And really, uh, ecologically, you know, the ants do so much of the heavy lifting to make life happen. You know, they are really the engines down there that are making it making it happen. Really complex. Yes. Yeah, so he's a real hero of mine. He's from Alabama. I'm from Alabama. So he's somebody that I've really kind of looked up to for a long time. And, uh, you know, a few years ago, I read his book, uh, Consilience, uh -huh. that uh, was all about kind of trying to bring art and science and spirituality together. And, yeah. you know, really, that's a lot of what my work is trying to do, too, Yeah, with this, with this book, you know. So, and by the way, that you can say those words, but let's appreciate how big of a swing that is. Like, I mean, to, to combine these things and, and anybody who hasn't read any E.O. Wilson really should, because it's, it's remarkable work and the way he tries to process and sometimes get it wrong, you know, which is remarkable. I think that he's like, I got this part wrong, you know, because yeah. people, people at his level, you don't typically hear them say that they only get things right. And one of my rules for life is like, if you're not making mistakes, you're making the first mistake. We're supposed to go out and screw up a little bit as we as we go along and learn. Heck, probably screw up more than we get it right if we're doing yeah. it right. Yeah. You know, he, he uh, uh, had a little controversy surrounding him and his, his detractors because of the way he extrapolated some of that stuff about ants to um, broader uh, roles in yeah. society with humans and stuff like that. And things that are kind of like biologically determined versus culturally determined, you know, so yeah, he had his moments of controversy, but all in all, just a, what, what amazing legacy and, and body of work and uh, real, um, you know, heroic effort to uh, help save nature and natural places and uh, shift awareness around all these issues. Yeah. A buddy of mine, Jeremy Kane, is working on um, the goal of the organization he's in is to preserve 30% of the world's oceans. Wow. And right now they're like at 1%, you know, but the thing is, is when you swim back, it's just one big bathtub. Right. And so <laughs> there's poison here. Well, there's poison there. And then there's poison here in the mouth, right? Like there's poison. Yeah. Everywhere. 
Right. Are we ever going to get this? I mean, this is an obvious thing. And this has nothing to do with politics or ethnicity. This is just a reality. Like we talk yeah. about environmentalism all the time. Well, here's an area where we are absolutely destroying this beautiful thing that provides so much to everybody and is part of our system. Yeah, right. There's no such thing as over there. Yeah. <laughs> out there, you know. Right. It is all interconnected and, you know, hey, the same water's been on earth for one, billions of years now. And so, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. we're, we're, drinking, we're drinking the same water that the dinosaurs drank and peed out. And, you know, uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah, there's just like if it's if there's toxins anywhere within the system, they find their way to us. And, you know, that's one thing I was hoping this work would do uh, as, as a way to kind of generate that consciousness around environmental issues. You know, you, when you go to the grocery store and you buy food and it's been packaged and uh, it has savvy logos and marketing around it, you know, it's, it's so detached from the source and the means of production. But if you're going out to your yard and you're eating something off of that, you know, that's it becomes much more present. All those kind of uh, factors and conditions that have gone into making that plant grow. So. Yeah, I was hoping that would bring that more to the foreground. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, right now, I'm thinking about my friend Julie, who's probably watching the show right now. She's English, and you know, English love their gardens. Yeah, uh, right. And, and uh, I just wanted to throw a shout out to her, but just yeah, in general, the garden in general has a lot of healing power in it, and most of it really is edible. Even if it's like a rose garden, you can consume roses, you know. So yeah. there is a lot of food around us. Uh, I, I can see the onion out, out of my tent flap here. I can see it all the way across my yard. Yeah. But that flower uh, comes from. And look, the garden we have won't feed us for very long, but there's also a persimmon tree and a pomegranate tree Ooh. and a lemon tree. So we've got a lot of, of food. Still got to go to the store. But yeah, you know, we do try to. We try to grow a lot of our own food. We got a Brussels sprout thing over there. It's huge, right? Well, well, nice. Sprouts and artichokes. And and it doesn't really take too much. Like nature has taken care of most of it. You know, we're in Southern California, so we're gonna have to add a lot of water to it. But that water goes into the water table and we're really just like using it for a moment and then it passes back back into the system, right? It's not it's not bad to water your, your plants. Yeah, yeah. Well, that sounds like you got a great setup there. It's a lot well, of good stuff. Is that onion a volunteer or is that something you planted? It actually, yeah, it's last year's failed onions. So is oh. it a volunteer or, is, you know, it's just like sometimes you're like, well, that didn't work. And then the next year, poop, it pops up like um, our tomatoes didn't work too good two years ago. But boy, last year, fuck the prop. We mm. could stop eating onions. They were I mean, uh, onions, tomatoes. Couldn't mm. stop them weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks worth of, of, of tomatoes. Yeah. We, okay, so you travel around the nation looking for edible foods. How do you map that? Well, you know, a lot of this work has been made possible by artist residencies, okay. which are just the best thing ever. Uh, so I've been really fortunate to, I don't know, go to eight or nine different residencies and they are all over the country. So it's kind of a competitive process. You apply to them, but get selected. I've, I've usually done month long residencies so I can go to somewhere really cool for a month. I've worked in uh, Washington State and Wyoming and Colorado and Alabama and uh, Kentucky, and New York, you know, for, wow. with these residencies and man, they just are, are so great at making artists feel welcome and productive and just being an amazing kind of support network for you to reach your uh, goals as an artist and just often just in just beautiful, beautiful locations yeah. with lots of good outdoor activities to do and uh, lots of other artists too. So you get a chance to really meet a lot of cool, like-minded folks and network and make friends. So, yeah. so you know, a lot of it's that. And then other times I just get in the car and just go to some forests. I got a portable system where I can work out on the road. And so, yeah, so I've, I've worked in 15 States so far and photographed about 150 plants. Yeah. Yeah. Have you caught a bug here? Are you going to have to keep doing this for a long time? <laughs> You know, I, I could do this the rest of my life. There's so many plants. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is go on the road this summer here in a couple of weeks and do more in the West and uh, upper kind of Great Plains and maybe even make it over to uh, 
the upper Midwest. Mm. And the Photoshop side of these is very labor intensive, very meticulous, takes a long, long time. So, you know, I think if I photograph a good number of plants this summer, that'll, I'll probably have two or three more years just of Photoshop work to get all those finished. And that would be enough to maybe do a second edition of this book down the line. Uh, but after that, I think it's a wrap. <laughs> okay. Okay. 15, 15 years of this is plenty. I got other ideas I want to get to. Yeah. yeah. At some point. And, uh, you know, but it does kind of it's tricky to after you've worked on a project for so long and established kind of identity around it as an artist and got this whole kind of, I don't know, infrastructure around it in terms of like, you know, websites and Instagram accounts and all this kind of stuff. It just seemed a little bit tricky to me how to segue into something new and not have to start totally over again. And, but to be determined, I'm, I'm the type of person who just has a lot of energy to create, has a lot of ideas. Yeah. It's, it just happens pretty naturally and organic, uh, organically for me. Are you looking in certain regions for certain species or are you just exploring when you do it? I'm just exploring, you know, I don't have any sort of a background in, in botany, whatever. So this is just totally a conceptual kind of project, you know, I just, I just had, had this idea and then just had to jump in. So yeah. I just get used, uh, some used guidebooks and just slowly start walking around and trying to figure out what's what out there. Yeah. And yeah. that's, cool. that's one of the most fun parts of this project is that, is that part of it, you know, where I literally get to go to beautiful locations, hike, and learn about plants as part of my art process. And yeah. you'll often learn a lot of really interesting, you know, facts and historical anecdotes and all these other kind of cool things too, as you're reading the guidebooks and learning about the plants and learn about the history of the people that lived or lived there and their usage of it and how Native Americans, you know, use, use plants. And it's, it's a really rich experience. And it's like, wow, I can't believe I get to do something so fun and rewarding as, as my, as my art practice. Uh, but yeah, that, that part is great. And it's, you know, you just got to take it slowly, but uh, when you first get to these places, it is kind of like this phenomenon where it's just like a sea of blurry green stuff. And it's really hard to differentiate individual plants and, and species. And then after just a few days of this, it all starts to crystallize and you start to recognize all your buddies out there in the field and, like oh, I know what you are, I know what you are, I know what you are, and uh, yeah, it really, uh, it really kind of radically changes your perception of place mm. by engaging in in this. I love it. My buddy yeah. Dave uh, runs a nature conservancy out here in Orange County, like a huge, an enormous, like ten thousand acres of, oh. of land. And when you walk with him, he's like, "This will taste like marshmallows." <laughs> this is like an otter pot and you're like what in the world like he just knows how everything you know they're all his friends like he knows these things he's like yeah if you're gonna plant milkweed in your yard you have to plant the right kind of milkweed for california monarchs because this kind is not good for them they'll eat it but you really need this other kind you know and so mm -hmm. that learning how to map your your environment it's uh it's a neat thing it's beautiful watching him just be in his zone and teaching and guiding about it. And it's never in a way you were like, shut up, Dave. It's always <laughs> tell me more, tell me more. You know, like where, you know, like we were on the trail one time and this lady was snip, snip, snipping um, like thistle off of the thing because it was invasive. And he's like, that's not the one you want to snip. Leave that one and don't snip it if you're going to dig it out. And he had gave this lady this class here. Here she was thinking she was doing the right thing. She had the right intention, but she didn't have the right knowledge. And so now like he was able to enable her to understand, you know, when you, when you do this, you're actually scattering this thing around or whatever it is, right. It doesn't, it doesn't work the way you want it to work. And I'll put a link for Dave's episode up there for everybody who wants to hear it. But the interesting thing about all of that scoping back is to run that conservant, you know, that land that he's got, right. Um, he has to partner with probably 27 or so different agencies and institutions whether it's uh, lending or cow fire or, you know, or, 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 and, and it's just, uh, it's mind boggling how much it takes for the political, I'll call it ecosystem to be able to manage this actual almost self-managing ecosystem where if we, if we leave it alone and don't inject too much stuff, it, it tends to thrive on its own. Right. But it takes, 
30 organizations to make it work in Orange County. Isn't that wow. kind of crazy? It is kind of crazy. Yeah. Is, is that due because kind of way he has it set up legally as like a preserve or a nonprofit or a Something like that? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of things going on there, right? Like there's the nonprofit itself, there's the parent company, there's Orange County, you know, and there's all these different elements that you've got to check with or organize through and, you know, get approval from whatever it is, right? And so, so there's a lot of just partnering, trying to create this wild space. And, uh, but it takes, I mean, it takes a lot of work. And he's got like, I'm going to say he's got, I think he told me 30,000 volunteer hours that come into the organization, maybe not every year, but a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of hours. Yeah. And there's people just, you know, being basically nature docents. Right. And so you've got to manage that. And that means you've got to deal with all kinds of just all kinds of different things to make this wild space truly be wild. And, um, you know, it's, it's incredible to think this one little plant or that little patch of grass or whatever it is, requires so much attention from us as opposed to to really just leaving it alone but we can't leave it alone right because if we left it alone it, it really wouldn't be there we would we would trample it cut it burn it whatever it's going to be yeah invasive species come in or yeah i don't know whatever yeah, we, but, have that here. we have a lot of that here. yeah just sounds like a lot of a lot of bureaucracy yeah but it's it's, a, sorry right uh, it's, it's almost like a type of ecosystem you know in, in itself it's, but in yeah. one way that, that builds robustness into what he's doing, you know, because he has so many connections with the community and yeah, yeah. I thought that really adds value, even though you got to deal with the headache of the bureaucracy of it all. And, and you, have, you have to have that guy like Dave who loves it, right? Like, okay. So one of the things you got to figure out is, is we have this Eagle. Okay. How do we nurture an environment for the Eagle? So that like, how do we not screw it up basically? Right. And so you go get the eagle expert. He's like, I'm a large, you know, raptor expert. Uh, you have this many owls here. And they, and they bring all this knowledge in that you have to have to manage the space, right? And then you realize that they're part of a system. And then you're like, you know, mice and everything, snakes and all these other things that you have to account for, especially when a wildfire comes through and burns it. And you're like, how do we get this flourishing again? You know? Yeah. But in a sustainable way. Yeah. That sounds pretty fun. That's always been like one of my dreams my goal is to have some land one of these days. Yeah. Um, Hope it happens. What's your favorite area that you've explored so far? Uh, let me think. I would have to say that uh, Willapa Bay was pretty interesting and very unlike uh, any other places I've ever been. And I was in Washington State. But it's like, you know, hundred yards to the east it had the bay and mm -hmm. you could just walk right out there and uh, feel uh oysters with your toes and pick them up out of the uh, muck and have fresh oysters you could go you know a half a mile to the west and hit the pacific ocean the giant beach and in between was just like old growth forest covered with moss and super swampy boggy kind of uh, woodlands, you know, and each one, even though, you know, we're just talking like maybe three fourths of a mile of, of width, uh, you had three totally different ecosystems yeah. right in that span and just Crazy. so, so many plants and just, yeah, re really unique. I've never kind of been to a place quite like that. Yeah. Are you, uh, uh, what's the guy's name? He's up in the North of California. He studies redwoods. I'll, I'll think of his name here as we are talking. But he would climb up into the redwood and explore the ecosystems in the tree. Are you aware of this at all? Cool. No, I don't think I've heard of that guy. It's incredible. And he's like, there's whole forests up there, right? So mm -hmm. when the tree gets struck by lightning, um, you know, like whatever's on top kind of gets like screwed up. But the tree keeps growing. And so it'll, it'll like throw two sprigs out. So he's like, there it could be a mini forest, mini redwood forest on top of a tree, mm -hmm. right? And up yeah. in there, they've seen, um, because birds fly by and everything, so there'll be bonsai other trees in there growing in, like, the the tree sloughing bark, sloughed off mm -hmm. bark. You know? yeah. So the bonsai trees of, like, pine trees and everything like that. Salamanders, like, they're hundreds of feet in the air. <laughs> wow. These are so big. Yeah. And it's, it's an ecosystem in and of itself. And, and one of the things he said was, like, we as humans can invent a pump that can um, – 
eternally shoot for 3,000 years, water 300 feet into the air and the volume that a redwood tree processes up and down. Like it's just an wow. amazing machine that creates this ecosystem all by itself. It's, it's an incredible. That is that, cool. Yeah. Yeah that's, yeah. that's one place I really want to visit too. I've never been to the redwood forest. I've been to Sequoia. You right. Know, so the, yeah. Those are pretty big trees, but I, I haven't been to the redwood. But, you know, that, that reminds me of just, I just feel like we're, we're living through a real golden era right now of um, studies in ecology. Just such groundbreaking research right now into ways that plants communicate, the way the fungus communicate, the way that uh, soil microbes work to generate life. And uh, it's, uh, I think it, we're seeing a real kind of sea change and growth of awareness around, around that stuff. It's really awesome to behold and uh, really just wonder filled, you know, and really radically yeah. changes our notions of, of these things. You know, there's still, I think there's a, still have like a hangover in Western thought uh, thinking of these things. It's kind of like simple little uh, machines that don't have consciousness that are just objects, you know, and uh, really fulsomely starting to see them as, as living beings and uh, in community and having complex relationships with other things that surround them. It's, it's really pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, we do have access to these things, right. And we also have, computers that can help us uh, gather information. So as we all go out and take pictures of onion flowers, whatever like that, you can, in theory, have AI just scrape from Instagram all of the images of all of the things and, and the geotag for where they are and really start to assemble this uh, health assessment based upon all. Like we're getting the ability to really use this, not just big data, but enormous data to look at the health of things and and the, the prevalence, and then also put out assignments like, "Hey, can someone go out and 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 find?" Um, it is I saw a story; they found a, a, a thought to be extinct moth, I think, in Chicago area, mm. just the other day. They're like, "Here it is," because we can get out more, and we can we can all be little naturists, you know, naturalists, uh, and go out and, and record these things. And then, yeah, let the computer go. Here's here is the here is a place where we don't have enough, or we have too much, like. In uh, the Bay Area, where I'm from up north, um, turkeys are just running crazy because there's no apex predator. And we all think they're neat, but nothing is stopping their explosion of population. So at some point, they'll have to be, you know, we're not too big on hunting around here, especially like going around neighborhoods with bow and arrows. I know like in Alabama, yeah. they're like, let's yeah. kill some turkeys. <laughs> in Alabama, <laughs> those things would be uh, dinner quickly. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. But it is, it is food and something does have to to call it otherwise it becomes invasive and dangerous to itself mm -hmm. and starts to uh wreak havoc on the ecosystem in other ways from overgrazing yeah. certain, certain plants or erosion or you know whatever i don't know did, did you ever read that story about uh, the impact of the wolves being reintroduced in yellowstone and how that radically changed the ecosystems there just from having one Kind of apex a predator they really do drive so much yeah ecologically yeah. i saw a documentary about it and it was great because it it juxtaposed all these positions you know and this really illustrates why this is so hard to do and why it often takes coordination with 30 elements to to make things happen the farmers legitimately can say hey i can't have wolves killing my livestock because no one's paying me for that right and so when the when there are too many wolves, I need to shoot them. And the government's like, yeah, you know what? When they're on your property, you can go ahead and shoot them, right? Meanwhile, like, you know, and there's all these different things where you're like, everybody's like, yeah, you know what? That's reasonable. You better do that. And so it all winds back to let's get these wolves out of here, you know, because <laughs> everybody's got like this. Like if you're um, in the hunting guide business and you have wolves out there, you know, taking out whatever they're taking out, you know, like elk or whatever. It's like, damn it, I, this is how we make our money. It's also how we understand elk and everything. You know, all these other things have to work in concert. We've got uh, mountain lions like crazy out here in California and, and Whoa, coyotes. Man. And, oh, man, we hate coyotes. However, coyotes, you know, look, we're in their yard and um, we built houses and we brought little tiny delicious dogs out to walk, you know, let them out in the morning. And coyotes are like, all right, I'll eat that. <laughs> or derves, yeah. Brunch. Right. Yeah. And, and it's look, we need coyotes to do whatever. I don't know what coyotes do, but I know that they do something. And <laughs> right? 
Yeah, coyotes uh, just run around eating everything. Yeah. They eat yeah. everything. Yeah. Raccoons, too. raccoons yeah. get by because they're cute, right? Coyotes look like the devil, but raccoons like, have little masks on and they have little hands. And so, but yeah, there's, there's little, little bandits. Hands. Yeah. 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 We have this perception. So, mountain lions and uh, coyotes get the short end, but boy, you know, I'll tell you what, too many raccoons, big problem. Big, big problem. Yeah. You know, I just feel like we have to balance kind of a, a human centered view of this with yeah. something more expansive and realize, yeah, all these animals and creatures have a job to do within the ecosystem and I feel like they have a right to kind of uh, be here, you know, right. that doesn't totally supplant our, our rights. So the guy's yeah. name is Steve Sillett. That's the guy, the Redwood uh, doctor guy. I'll send you a link to his work. It's really remarkable. All yeah, right. What a, cool. uh, Jimmy project. And by the way, everybody we're, we're, we're talking here with Jimmy and uh, he's got a book um, and it's really like a nature guide and it's called, Edible Plants, a, a Photographic Survey of Wild Edible Botanicals from North America. And you can get that on Amazon. Please do that. That uh, helps support that. And if you want to support the Break It Down Show, go to breakitdownshow.com. Yeah, look, we sell shirts. I got one on today. Uh, we can uh, sell shirts there. So go to the, the, the little Break It Down Show store link, and you can find a shirt there and buy one. That helps me out. Or just go to PayPal and click on that. And uh, look, invent your own subscription. I don't, I don't need Patreon. I need you and I need me and then we'll work together. I'll work hard. I'll create things. And you, uh, I don't know, kick in 10 bucks, 10 bucks a month. That's what I'm asking for. Um, all right. So so now that we've plugged things and everybody really should get Jimmy's book. And I, you know what I always say? And so I always say, Jimmy, I'm like, hey, don't just buy one, buy two. Buy one for <laughs> and do a buddy yeah. read, right? Because these books really aren't that expensive. Um, you're sitting down at Photoshop. For, for a long, long time, it's harder to get the photo than it or to process the photo than it is to get the photo. Why is yeah. that? Well, uh, part of it is just the process that I've that I've come up with. Uh, you know, I, I pin the plants on a here, I'll hold this up again so you see. So you know, I, I pin I pin this up on a white backdrop, totally flat, and photograph it. Uh, but then I have to settle into the Photoshop and. I have to get rid of all the pens. I get rid of all the shadows so that it's uh, no ground, you know, that you can see it sitting on anything. So the yeah. images look kind of like they're floating. It's one of the illusions I'm going for. And then the plants are just uh, very, very constructed, very montaged. So I take a lot, lot of liberties to uh, rearrange things, to add new leaves, new flowers, extra roots, and design it. And... Uh, yeah, it's just very, very labor intensive. You know, I'm working at the pixel pixel level a lot of times on these to really groom it and make it tight, tight work. So, you know, I want the plants to still um, be um, serviceable, serviceably realistic, right? To where they do work as guides for yeah. foraging or, rec or uh, just plant identification. But at the same time, I'm trying to really make these works of art individually. Yeah. And to, uh, yeah, come up with an aesthetic that is, um, I don't know, can, can, can be contemplative and open up kind of that more numinous experience ar around these things. And yeah, so there just takes a lot, a lot of work to really groom, groom the images and, and get to that, get to that spot. The, uh, the artistic license you get to use to, to tell us the story of these plants, you know, involves a lot of different choices for you because sometimes, you know, like um, Greek columns, everything, they're, they're not actually as straight as we want them to be, right? Because the optical illusions of things. And so when you see something and it needs a little bit of symmetry, I guess you're saying you'll add a root in to, to create some balance that may not be there. Yeah. But if you were to go into the wild and see that plant, your guide will represent that plant well enough for you to identify and go, that is, you know, eucalyptus horribilis or whatever it is. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't, I don't do anything that's like atypical, a uh -huh. you know? Uh, I don't take a plant that's this big and make it this big and give it you know, tons of crazy stuff. But I just feel like I make them one, like just they're kind of like archetypal, you know, they're just so perfect. You'd never see anything kind of this perfect in nature because invariably, you know, bugs have eaten the leaves or some of the stuff started to die off or, or whatever. Right. right. But, yeah. What really the flower of the plant. I mean, you rarely see the flower of most plants. I mean, roses are aside, but like, you know, cherry blossoms for, I don't know, a week, maybe, you know? Mm -hmm. 
is that part of the consideration where you show like show it in bloom or is that not something you worry about well you know i'm, I'm often at these places for a month so i just got to get what i can get maybe it's not totally uh, ripe or the flowers aren't in bloom but i'm also no purist i won't tell you which plants but there's plenty of plants that i've also appropriated images off the internet i've never told anybody this like <laughs> in this kind of format because <laughs> uh it just seems like a, a, a betrayal of this whole like a notion of scientific illustration and botanical illustration. But I'm a, I'm an artist, so I don't really worry about kind of these uh, purist arguments. But yeah, there's there's yeah. several of them where I was like, yeah, I really need a flower on this one, so I just find some images on the internet and appropriate them. And if they're high enough resolution, I can use them. And I usually, you know, doctorate some, so I don't uh, have any sort of copyright issues. Where it's like, you know, I might get a flower and I'll copy and paste a couple of the petals around, change them around and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's unique, but yeah. it's appropriated. So yeah, I don't yeah. have any, I don't have any moral uh, dilemmas with doing that kind of stuff. I don't think you should. I mean, look, yeah. those you posting these pictures up there for everybody, you know, and, uh, and if it's the right example of one, then God damn, thanks for doing that. That'll save <laughs> the trip down to the, you know, the, whatever, the bottom of the snake tail in uh, Tennessee or whatever to go get this, uh, this Daisy or whatever that you've, you've captured yeah. what um what trip didn't have the best experiences uh, on the ones you've gone because you know look being on the road means you've got to deal with stuff that's not the best sometimes right so what are some uh what are some hard stories well i'm trying to think uh you know i i can't really think of anything too bad that's happened i don't know normally it's just been really great experience uh you know e each residency is different so i've had a couple residencies where maybe I just didn't kind of uh, gel with the other folks. Uh, uh, I've had some residencies where it was just me, you know, and it, there wasn't that community of artists. So sometimes I got a little bit uh, lonely just working yeah. by yourself for, for a month in some remote, remote location, but just tried to power, power through it. Um, and then otherwise it's just, instances where I've had to kind of like push myself where I'm not comfortable, like wading into muck, uh, you know, knee or uh, thigh deep to yeah. get a plant like that water lily one I got. It was in a lake in um, in Louisiana. And all I could think is like alligator snakes, alligator snakes, alligator <laughs> snakes. Please, baby Jesus, be with me because I just got to go for it, you know, and I just had to like wade through this muck. Oh, and go go get that plant out <laughs> but you know i, I made it and I lived to tell the tale no good either and uh you know you may ruin a pair of boots with muck you know it's it gets yeah uh, really bad yeah, yeah. describe a day for you when you're out and 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 like how hard do you drive yourself in these things like i'm a taskmaster i'm i'm the worst boss for myself i'm like you will get these next few things done and, yeah uh, i drive myself like crazy so describe your day just an average day well, you know, when, when I'm at one of these residencies and I know I just have a short window of time, I really do have to get to it and try and photograph everything I can because who knows when I'll be back to one of these far flung places. So, you know, when I when I uh, get a plant, I, I dig it up and take it back to the studio, clean it up. And then I really have to just like get to work because the plant is going to wilt fairly quickly. So I have to just start uh, pinning it up and often I just got to like focus and just get it done. And sometimes just the pinning up stage for some of these that are more intricate plants, I might take like three hours of pinning mm. to a wall and I just got to get it done before it wilts. And, you know, it's like every single leaf has to be pinned down flat. Everything has to pin, be pinned down totally flat for it to all be in focus with high resolution when I'm, when I'm done. So, Often yeah. I'll have to, you know, like cut a branch or if it's a thicker one, kind of cut it in half to where I can mount it uh, flushly on, on the wall and then uh, can can photograph it. So, you know, when, when I'm really cranking, I could do two or three of these a day. Um, I don't really worry so much about the Photoshop side at that stage. So when, yeah. I, when I'm in the field working, you know, that, that's kind of a, a, a day of doing this kind of stuff. Um, but then, you know, most of the time, the other, you know, 10 months of the year or 11 months, depending on how much field work I'm doing, uh, it's just the Photoshop side of it. 
Yeah. And that's uh, kind of set up differently, but it works really great for me because uh, I can just have it sitting there on my computer and I can work for a couple hours in the morning, then go do my thing and then work again for a few hours in the evening and just always have something to work on. Yeah. And it's more like I can just kind of keep plotting away at it and it, 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 and it gets done often. Yeah. Like one of the really big plants might take me three months or over a hundred hours of Photoshop, you know, work to do, but I just plot a plot away at it. And I just really enjoy that side of the practice because something about that is very meditative to me. I just, I listen to so much music. I'm really into music and just yeah. use that time to discover new bands and listen to different uh, podcasts and music shows and stuff like that. And love that. Really love just that. works out perfect for me. You know, I get, I get some of both. I get to be outside and travel and have adventures and learn new stuff. And then I get to have that kind of more like meditative side mm -hmm. of the practice too. So. I get that. I get that. Yeah. For sure. I, I get a very similar thing where I get to often go, I try to as much as I can go out to grab interviews. I call it in the wild, right? Literally yeah. sit down across from you in your house in Alabama or wherever you're at. And then, um, yeah, then you come back and you mess with it and you, you, you bring things. I don't edit the content at all. I want what you say to be what you say. I never want to put someone in a bad light, but I might make a clip of what you say, attaching mm -hmm. it to the whole thing, but mm -hmm. all of these things. And then just thinking about questions and how to ask them. And like, you know, one of the questions you always want to ask is like, what's next, right? If I'll ask you at that point, but how can I ask that question differently? You know, instead of saying, what's your day like? I say, describe a day in the life, you know? And, and so you just look for these little things. And, and that happens when I'm driving or when I'm, you know, in my tent here in the backyard working, you need know, to develop those, uh, just that efficiency and that elegance that comes after a lot of repetitions. And it is a great part of it. Cause like you, I get to listen to music or whatever it is while I'm working. What, what, what's your home band? Like, where do you want to go most often when you're listening to music? Oh, where, where do I, like, where do I listen to music on the internet? Oh, I mean, like, like I don't want to say your favorite band cause that stuff moves around. Oh. Like when, right. like what's your go-to band that you're always, always going to listen to? Well, I like to listen to a lot, a lot of new stuff, you know, but uh, recently I've been enjoying Kevin Morby a lot. I think he's yeah. great indie stuff. So, mm -hmm. you know, I tend towards indie Americana, singer, songwriter, sure, post rock, sure. Uh, right. whatever. But I, I just think band camp is just fascinating. I just love band camp. That's where you hang out. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah I go to Bandcamp uh, several days a week. I go through and listen to the different shows on Bandcamp. This is just it just blows my mind. You know, it's like you want to listen to the uh, I don't know Indonesian hip hop. I'm like, sure, yeah. I never knew there was Indonesian hip hop. Right. Or the uh, right. you know uh, the death metal scene in Argentina. I'm like, really? They have a death metal? Let me. It's just me so expansive. You know, there's so many niches. Uh, of music that you're never going to hear on the radio and so many Moroccan rap in French. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, all right, cool. So I usually go through there a few times a week and uh, I like uh, NPR stuff on Friday, you know, they have the releases for that week in the tiny desk and I like KEXP. It's great to listen to. Yeah. 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 And good background stuff. Even when you're not focused on it, it's still just good to have in the background. Do you, yeah, uh, so you go, like a, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just saying I've got a decent record collection too. So just spend, spend some oh, vinyl too. Into it, yeah. When you go out and you grab that water lily, that crocus, that uh, palm, do you actually eat them? Uh, you know, I've, I've tried most of the plants, not, not all of them. Sometimes I'm just not sure if it's uh, polluted water or whatever it's a little bit fishy to me so maybe it's not in maybe it's not ripe you know so i can't really do it other stuff like i don't know there's one plant that i photographed actually in california that you might have seen it's called soap plant sure that yeah. i really want to try but it's like you have to dig a pit and roast it for 24 hours and i was like ah, i just don't know if i can pull that off right now i got you know i gotta yeah. get to, i gotta get to work so that one i'd really like to try at some point because when it's in its raw state it's basically like yeah you use it as a soap right you can right. smash it up and it's got the bubbles and you can wash your hair with it but somehow you pit, pit roast it for 24 hours and it gets caramelized and and, and sweet but yeah. there are so many plants that are really delicious you know and they're totally new tastes for me 
because I've never never tried a lot of these things. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's really good. So Just I look for them. Go ahead. Oh, so so now it's like I got my favorites that I look for when I'm when I go hiking and, and camping and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, I'm hoping that stuff's in bloom right now and I can get right. to nibble on that. Yeah, get a little nibbly. Just mm -hmm. behind is a book uh, by um, a guy named Buddy Levy, and I just love his books. They're so good. And uh, he's written about the conquistadors, and this book back here is about uh, Francisco Oriana, who is the first known person to ever go from like the Andes all the way out uh, to the Atlantic on the in, in the Amazon basin, right? So he just goes the wow. entire length of things. It wasn't on purpose; it just kind of happened. <laughs> and um, along the way, they find like this uh, this yam plantation, and and they're like, "Oh, thank God, we're starving. We're gonna die if we don't if we don't get some food." But there's two variants of this yam and one of them requires a significant amount of prep and that was the one they found and so if you eat it it can kill you right and yeah. so and if nothing else you're like you're deathly ill for a while as you try to survive this thing and so if you got the wrong kind of yam totally edible when processed but when not processed not you know and so there's all these things where yeah, yeah there's like a lot of you know mashing and roasting or whatever it takes to make it to to where you can actually enjoy it it's uh yeah it's tricky yeah. you know that's one yeah. one like disclaimer one caveat anybody should definitely do some research before they just start eating stuff because yeah. there's plenty of examples out there of stuff like that like if you, you know, if you don't cook it it's poisonous mm -hmm. you know, like elderberries right. Right? like elderberries you got to cook those yeah to make them edible and there's other plants like uh with like popping to mind it's like may apple right uh -huh. the, the fruit is edible and good but if you eat other parts of that plant dead your toast man so you gotta you gotta be careful and there's look like plants too oh you know, yeah talking about right. wild onions there's one that's like what's that called death camas it looks a little bit like a wild onion so gotta make sure you're actually eating onion and not yeah. something with death in the name yeah <laughs> right that's why i think you're with that name. <laughs> yeah. Do you mess with mushrooms at all or any kind of fungus uh you know i i don't know much about mushrooms Okay, so they're not part of your 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 exploration. Yeah, you know they're not technically plants, so it didn't fit with the kind of like title of the series that I was doing. I did get a book uh, recently, though, a field guide to mushrooms. So you know, I might, I might add a few of those to the series. You know, mush, mushrooms are a next level of of difficult though in terms of identification and stuff like that. You know, so I I know the basic ones that are super easy to identify: morels and chanterelles and uh, chicken of the woods and puff balls mm -hmm. and things like that but i i quickly get really really confused with with mushrooms even even when i have the guidebook you know and, and trying to figure out what something is because they they change so much during their life cycle and whatever so yeah 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 it's just yeah. another degree of difficulty to me and another world that we're unlocking like we're really starting to accept that there's value in these things, not only um, ecologically, but, you know, like medicinally, like what they can do for us. It's, it's remarkable. Yeah. We're certainly seeing that with uh, psychedelic mushrooms lately. And you yeah, know, you mentioned earlier kind of that research about, um, you know, how uh, plants are communicating and stuff like that. There was a really fascinating one recently about mushrooms and how they've discovered that they have a vocabulary of about 50 words. It's crazy. A vocabulary, right. But they, yeah. Yeah. Like how, how smart is that? You know, I'm yeah. really starting yeah. to think that they, they are really who's in control here. <laughs> right? they're really, they're they're a lot more driving, realize that's for sure. Yeah. They're driving evolutionary processes in a lot of way and yeah. maybe even created us as just good compost. I don't know. Yeah. Who knows? Right. Who knows? Yeah. All right. So, so what's next for you and then we'll wrap it up. Well, let's see. Next week, I am hitting the road, and I'm in Phoenix, Arizona right now, and I'm going to just kind of go straight north uh, up to Colorado and Wyoming and Montana and photograph plants there and try and spend the next couple months just out on the road uh, camping and finding new plants. So super excited about, about this summer. I'm a professor. I got the summer off, so I'm just going to get outside for the whole summer, oh, me and my so dogs, and yeah, it's going to be great. Well, so, all right, so everybody, the book is called Edible Plants, a photographic survey of the wild edible botanicals of North America. And uh, here's your guy right here, Jimmy Fike, who's done all the picture in and all the, uh, all the uh, Photoshopping to make it happen. Definitely go out and get that book. Uh, anything in closing at all before we wrap it up, Jimmy? 
Oh, let's see. Oh, one other announcement. Uh, if anybody is kind of uh, over on the east side of the country, I do have a exhibition at the Pittsburgh Botanical Garden opening in July. So you can see some of my prints there. Nice. Yeah, definitely go check that out. If you're in Pittsburgh, go to check out yeah. any botanical garden anywhere, wherever you're at, because this is part of that slowing down and uh, and seeing the world around us. But yeah, man, I appreciate you doing it. Stand by for a sec. I'll come back to you. Let me close this thing down. Okay, buddy. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to. Curated by yours truly. Thank you.